Hey guys, it's Ellen Brock, novel editor. Today is going to be the second video in my series on advanced story structure. So in this series, rather than focusing on the major plot points, I'm focusing or putting more emphasis on the sections in between the major plot points because I think that's the section or those are the sections that people tend to really struggle with even after they understand the major plot points. So in the previous video, we talked about the status quo and how the status quo will eventually be disrupted. And that disruption is sometimes called the catalyst or the inciting incident. Um, but I just prefer to refer to refer to it as the disruption. Today, we're going to talk about the section that happens after the disruption of the status quo. This section in screenwriting is often called the debate, and I'm going to stick with that as the term that I use in this video, mainly because I think there isn't really a term that I prefer and debate sort of best encapsulates what this can look like in different genres. So even though we're talking about novels and films, I am going to use the more screenwriter focused terminology of the debate. I am going to be using films as the examples in this video as well. Not because what I'm saying doesn't apply to novels, but because I want to give examples that either you might already know really well or you can quickly watch them and all of the the um, films that I'm going to be referencing are streaming at various places so you'll be able to most likely watch at least a few of them. Um, that way you'll be able to learn more quickly and easily and these structure, structural elements are also a lot easier to see in film than in novels. So that's why I'm using films as an example, but I am planning on doing a series where I deconstruct novels. So if you have a novel that you want me to structurally deconstruct, just let me know in the comments uh, because I'll be preparing those videos in the near future. So in case you're concerned about spoilers, I will be providing information and details about the plots of several films. However, I'm not going to go past the first plot point, so it's really not more than you'd probably get from watching a trailer or something like that. But if you are concerned, the films that I'm going to be talking about and potentially spoiling just the beginning of um, are Juno, Toy Story, Deadpool, Secret Window, Oculus, and The Hunger Games, the film. So I want to start by talking about the length of the debate section. If you watched the previous video, you might remember that we talked about the status quo being of a variable length, so it can be very short or very long. And the debate section is exactly the same. However, it's dependent on the length of the status quo. So if you have a short status quo, you're most likely going to have a long debate. And if you have a long status quo, you're most likely going to have a short debate. These uh, two sections could also be closer to 50-50. And that's completely fine as well. Anywhere, any sort of split or divide is completely fine, but we're shooting for about 20 to 25% of the total length of the story split between these sections. So we might think about the disruption of the status quo as a sort of floating plot point that can hit anywhere in the first quarter, but it splits it into two distinct parts and those parts are the status quo and the debate. Where that hits is completely up to you and dependent on your story. In the previous video, we talked about reasons why you might need a longer or shorter status quo. So if you're not sure where you want that disruption to occur, you might find uh, the previous video more helpful in determining that than this video. So what actually happens in this section, in the debate? This section can look pretty different between different books and films because what the character is doing is reacting to the disruption of the status quo. And because the status quo disruption can look very different between different books and films, what the character has to do, wants to do, needs to do in this section can vary quite a bit. But what this section always contains is a reaction to that disruption. In many cases, the protagonist is trying to maintain or hold on to the status quo. So they're not ready to, to have things change or accept that things have changed. They want to keep things as they were. Sometimes this can take the form of denial. So the character might sort of be crossing their arms and saying, you know, no, my house isn't haunted and no, my spouse isn't going to leave me or no, I'm not in financial trouble. A really good example of this is Toy Story. In Toy Story, Woody is Andy, the human boy's favorite toy. And for his birthday, the human boy Andy gets Buzz, which is this new, really cool, exciting toy. And we see that Buzz is replacing Woody, but Woody is in denial about that. He tells his friends, you know, just wait, everything's gonna go back to normal. 
you know, it was just an accident that Andy put Buzz in my spot on the bed. Woody is not able to accept or he's refusing to accept the reality of the situation that he's being replaced. In many cases, the character will be attempting to maintain a status quo that is impossible. And usually that's because they have two different paths that they could sort of take. And one would be externally preferable and one would be internally preferable. So you can think of this as two options, one that's positive externally, but negative internally, and one that's negative externally and positive internally. A good example of this is Juno. So in Juno, we don't really see much of a setup, but we can assume or infer that her status quo is just being a normal teen. So the disruption of her status quo is finding out that she's pregnant, which of course would force her to leave normal teen life or it would force her to be in a very different sort of situation. Though the debate is pretty subtle in this film, it does a really good job of demonstrating that push and pull between the two options. So the easy choice in terms of maintaining an external status quo would be for Juno to go to the women's clinic and end the pregnancy, which is what she sort of attempts to do. But we know that she's also struggling with that not being internally satisfying because we can see that in several um, subtler moments, hesitations and interactions and things like that. And more specifically, when she talks to uh, Bleeker, who's the father, she tells him that she's thinking about nipping it in the bud and asks, are you okay with that? Or are you cool with that? And you can tell in that moment that she's really hoping that he'll argue with her, that he'll say, no, he's not okay with it. And through that, we can see that she's really struggling with feeling okay with it, that this isn't an, an option that is satisfying to her on an internal level. It's not uh, al allowing her to sort of maintain her, her perhaps her uh, status quo view of herself. So in that, she is needing to choose between uh, an externally preferable option and an internally preferable option, but there's really no option where she can maintain both, where she can maintain her external status quo of just being a normal teen and her internal status quo of how she views herself or her moral compass or however you want to conceptualize it. So the key thing to remember uh, is that in many, many, many cases, the protagonist is waffling between two bad choices. So another really good example of this is in Deadpool. Um, in Deadpool, uh, his Wade Wilson's status quo is that he's pretty much just living a happy life with his girlfriend, Vanessa, and then his status quo is disrupted when he's diagnosed with cancer. So here we see again, he's choosing between two bad options. So he can either stay with Vanessa through his cancer treatment, which he views as sort of putting her through a difficult time and ruining her life and um, you know forcing her to see him deteriorate and all of that being very negative. And then on the other hand, of course, his desire to be with her and to stay with her, but he can't do both. He can't stay with her and not have her uh, be forced to cope with his cancer and what that will do to them. So it's two bad options. And that's important because you don't want the decision to be easy. If the decision was easy or simple, there wouldn't be a debate. So we really need to make sure that both of those options are negative. So we could think about or conceptualize this section as the character perhaps asking, uh, how can I return to the status quo as quickly and as pain-free as possible? And of course, in that case, the answer is going to be they can't. Or they might be asking uh, which of these two options is the least bad? So which of these is the least painful? And then eventually they're going to be forced to make a choice between those two things. So what ends the debate? The debate section ends when a moment or an event forces or inspires the character to make their choice, to pick which of those two bad options they're going to go with. So in Deadpool, that moment happens when um, Wade Wilson is approached by a recruiter and the recruiter asks him to try this experimental treatment. It will cure his cancer, but it will also turn him into a superhero, which he knows will force him away from being with Vanessa, his girlfriend. So that path is going to force him away from her. So in this type of situation, what you'll usually see, especially with the hero's journey, is you'll see a refusal of the call. You'll see the character initially say no. 
And this helps to emphasize that this is a difficult choice. If the character were to just say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go with that, I'll, I'll take that option, we wouldn't really, as the reader, feel that, that difficulty and that challenge and how momentous of a decision it is for the character. So there's usually that hesitation in there when it's a very overt option, when, when um, the debate uh, sort of takes, sort of ends through the form of a proposition. So a character just saying, hey, do you want to do this thing? Normally, the protagonist will say no. They'll normally make an attempt to go back to the status quo at that point, and they'll realize the status quo actually doesn't exist anymore. So they'll sort of have to face the reality that they really can't go back. So um, in Deadpool, we get a, a voiceover, which actually really helps us uh, to hear because he's literally telling us this. Um, in the voiceover, he goes um, back to his uh, apartment and he's hanging out with Vanessa, watching her sleep. Um, he's just sort of sitting there contemplating, but through the voiceover, we understand that he's debating uh, between those two bad options. And he's thinking, you know, I really can't put her through this. And even though, you know, I've already said no to this recruiter, I just can't do it. I can't actually follow through with making that choice. So he packs his bag and he leaves the apartment and that makes his decision. He's chosen his path. His path is away from Vanessa. Another common iteration of this would be the protagonist is threatened and initially they just don't take the threat that seriously or it's not significant enough for them yet and then another event pushes them into into feeling that, you know, okay, this really is a big deal. This really is a big threat now. So a good example of that is in the film Secret Window. So in Secret Window, which is an adaptation of a Stephen King story, um, the main character is a writer named Mort. He's struggling with divorce and writer's block, and he is approached by a man called John Shooter who tells him, you stole my story, you stole, um, you plagiarized uh, this manuscript. And so he's struggling and debating with whether or not he can sort of acknowledge the fact that that's what he did. Uh, to acknowledge that he might have plagiarized it would hurt his sort of internal status quo, his sort of internal view of himself, but to deny it, he is sort of forced to contend with this unsavory character of John Shooter. So what happens in terms of this ending the debate structure that we're talking about is John Shooter confronts him and he says, you know, I'm going to give you three days. You figure out how to prove that this manuscript um, wasn't stolen um, or else. And we see that Mort, the protagonist, clearly doesn't take this threat very seriously. He, he feels threatened, but he doesn't take it that seriously. He goes home and he kind of thinks about, you know, maybe kind of doing something, but then he decides to take a nap. But then we get the event that pushes him and he has to make a choice and that's when he finds that his dog has been killed, that John Shooter has killed his dog. He left a note uh, reiterating that uh, Mort has three days to prove that he didn't steal this story. So in that moment, we feel along with Mort that push that, you know, now you've done it, now I have to get involved. There's no way now of saying, uh, of sort of staying on the fence or saying, I'm not really going to have to make this choice. You know, he really feels like at that, in that moment, he, he needs to, to make a choice now. Things have gotten serious. This isn't just, you know, little threats. This is, uh, you know, actual violence. So he then goes to the police and that's what pushes him towards um, or, or indicates that he's chosen a path. He's chosen this path of fighting externally rather than choosing the internal path of saying, you know, maybe I did plagiarize this story, um, but that would force him into an uncomfortable um, internal turmoil. So he's sort of choosing the external turmoil instead. In many cases, the path being chosen is going to be pretty subtle. So for example, in Toy Story, we have um, Woody just sort of having to face reality. He really can't deny reality anymore. He sees, um, you know, the poster that used to be about uh, of him is now of Buzz. The bedspread that used to be of him is now of Buzz. And the icing on the cake is when Andy, the human boy, chooses to take Buzz to bed with him at night instead of Woody. And so Woody, you know, sleeps in the toy chest and he wakes up the next morning in the toy chest. So he can't deny anymore that he's been replaced. He's literally physically been replaced. So that's another form that you'll see with uh, the end of the debate is sometimes it's just, it becomes impossible to deny reality. He just, he can't deny it anymore. The debate will also sometimes end by eliminating one of the options because when push comes to shove and the character looks 
really in the eye of one of the options, they realize, you know, I actually can't follow through with that option or I can't do that. And Juno is a really good example of that. She goes to the women's clinic. Outside the women's clinic, there's a girl who tells her that, you know, her baby has fingernails. And we see when she goes in that she's noticing all um, the fingernails of all the people in the waiting room. And she's sort of getting this anxiety attack and she's realizing, you know, I can't follow through with this. You know, when she looks in the eye of what that option is, she realizes she doesn't actually even have the capacity to follow through with that choice. And so she's forced to make the other choice, which is stay pregnant. And this film is actually a really good example of this. And um, it's quite overt because she goes, she runs um, out of the clinic to her friend and she tells her friend, I'm staying pregnant, which is a very conclusive statement. And her friend re reminds her of um, what's at stake when she makes this choice. So sort of what the risks are of this choice, you know, they're not going to let you go on spring break, everybody's going to get really mad at you. And you know, you're going to get pregnant, like physically grow in pregnancy. And uh, Juno replies with saying, well, maybe they'll canonize me for being so selfless. And that really shows that she's picking what she thinks is the internally correct choice rather than picking what could be the externally uh, easy choice or what would easily let her go back to the status quo. So I really like that as an example because I think it's pretty blatant um, what her debate was about and how uh, she decided to choose the more um, emotionally fulfilling path over the easier external path. So now that we've talked about the debate and sort of the different forms that it takes, let's talk about the common problems and pitfalls with this section. So one of the most common problems is simply not defining what the debate is. Even though the debate can take really subtle forms and you might have to kind of try to find it in films or books, especially when you're not really used to looking for the structural elements, you might have to really try to assess, you know, what what's the debate even really about. But as the writer, if you're plotting, especially if you're plotting or if you're in the editing phase and you're sort of refining your story, you really need to define what's the debate actually about because it's very difficult to create the sort of tension that's necessary to prevent this section from feeling slow or meandering if you don't define the debate. Because what you don't want is the is this section of your story to feel like you're just stalling. You're just making it take longer on purpose. And you've probably read books or seen films where you've sort of felt that vibe. Either the, the character just had no good reason not to choose a path and it just sort of felt like the story stagnated and it couldn't really... Uh, you know, get going or get past this section. And that's often because the debate just isn't that well defined. So writing it down can be helpful, especially if you're a plotter. Uh, a, you have to sort of think about uh, how to put your character between a rock and a hard place and to really put risks and stakes on both sides so that there isn't an obvious choice. So for example, in Deadpool, if Wade Wilson had been given an 80% chance of surviving his cancer, we wouldn't really have understood what the debate was about. We would have said, okay, well, statistically, you know, maybe just stay with Vanessa because probably you're going to live and you guys will be able to be happy together. It requires that the cancer be terminal for him to have that debate because we have to know there's almost no chance that he's going to survive and he's almost definitely going to have to see the effects of the cancer on Vanessa. And we would not have felt that if if the debate wasn't as defined, if, it, if those risks weren't defined. So we really need to know what's bad about both paths so that we understand why the character doesn't just jump on one right away. It's also important to note that this decision only needs to be difficult because of who your character actually is. So another character would have absolutely no problem staying with their partner um, through the cancer treatment and, you know, dying sort of in the arms of their partner. Lots of characters would not have a problem with that, but Wade Wilson does have a problem with that. So it's important to keep in mind, it doesn't have to be something that's universally understood or accepted. It just has to be true for your character. So there has to be, you know, a, a view of both options being bad for this character specifically. Another really common problem with the debate section is thinking that the debate has to be about the most obvious question that the novel poses or that the setup poses. So a really good example to talk about this is the film Oculus. In the film Oculus, it's about a brother and sister who experience a tragedy during their childhood, which the sister attributes to a haunted mirror and the uh, brother attributes to their father, so a non-supernatural source. 
if we were plotting this, you know, we were writers, we were talking about, you know, how would we plot this out, we might uh, look at this, di this dichotomy that's set up of the sister believing in the paranormal, the brother who is the protagonist not believing in the paranormal and thinking, you know, the, the impacts of this, child of this childhood event uh, were caused by, um, you know, natural normal causes of, you know, their father. Um, we might look at that and say, well, then the debate is going to be, is it supernatural or is it not? Because that's the most obvious question posed by the story. But that's actually not at all what the debate in this uh, film is about. Uh, the debate's actually about whether or not the brother will help the sister, even though he doesn't believe that the mirror is paranormal. So the sister has gotten the mirror and she's, she wants to destroy it. She wants his help destroying it. Uh, she sort of just wants him around during this experience. And he wants to sort of maintain his view, which is that, you know, it wasn't paranormal. The events weren't paranormal. But his debate's not about that. It's not about, is it paranormal or is it not? It's, do I help my sister with this or do I not? So his decision to stay with her as she tries to destroy the mirror is the conclusion of his debate. He's made his choice. You know, I'm going to engage with this uh, this event, I'm going to help her destroy this mirror, or at least be present while she destroys this mirror because I care about her. He's not deciding anything about the paranormal. So when you're plotting your novel, it's important to keep uh, to keep that in mind that just because there is an obvious question, that doesn't mean that that has to be what the debate is about. Another common problem is not entangling the status quo problem with the debate. So if you recall in the status quo video, we talked about a longer status quo. Uh, usually it contains some kind of conflict or problem that the character is trying to solve a status quo problem. That's not always the case. Like we just talked about with some examples, um, Juno doesn't really have, or we don't know of any status quo problem that's overtly defined. Wade Wilson doesn't have an overtly defined status quo problem. And so once a disruption happens, uh, they don't need to worry about some other element or some other component because it's just not there. However, frequently there will be a status quo problem, like we talked about with Secret Window, with Mort, he was dealing with divorce and writer's block, so he has these two big status quo problems that he's trying to deal with, and those problems don't go away when the status quo is disrupted. So when John Shooter accuses him of plagiarism, he still has writer's block and he still has his divorce to contend with. Those issues don't go away. So a common problem is not entangling those two things because by entangling those two things, having them sort of impact each other and interact with each other, it helps you to build up more content for this debate section. So for example, in Secret Window, Initially, Mort uh, doesn't look at the manuscript. So John Shooter leaves the manuscript. He says, you plagiarize this, you know, here it is. Here's the manuscript you plagiarize, you know, not in so many words, but that's basically what happens. Uh, and Mort throws it in the trash. But Mort goes and tries to work on his novel. He gets writer's block, he gets frustrated, he gets up to get a drink and he sees uh, his cleaning lady has put the manuscript on the table. So then he looks at it because he is procrastinating because of his status quo problem, which is writer's block. Later on, when um, John Shooter gives him his ultimatum and he says, you know, uh, you have three days to prove that you wrote this story first, a big part of why he doesn't initially take action, like we talked about his dog's death pushes him to take action, but why he doesn't take action at that first threat, a big part of that is because he would have to talk to his wife, his ex-wife, in order to get the manuscript from her, to have her mail it to him so he can say, look, see, you know, I did publish this, here it is. But he doesn't want to talk to his ex-wife because of his status quo problem. So his status quo problem is interacting with his debate and that helps to build up more content in this section. So that is very often necessary in order for this section to be long enough and also uh, it helps to sort of incorporate those elements um, or incorporate the status quo conflict and sort of maintain its relevance a little bit. So that's something that you probably want to consider, especially if you have a longer status quo. Again, uh, like we talked about in the status quo um, video, it's completely fine if there's not a status quo problem, as long as the status quo isn't too long, in which case it's going to feel really, really slow uh, to the reader or viewer. The last common problem that I want to talk about in this video is misidentifying the first plot point. So often the debate gets uh, muddled or confused, forgotten, mixed up, etc., because 
at the plotting phase or perhaps at the writing or editing phase if you incorporate structure at, in those phases of your process, um, the writer will believe that they, they know um, a certain event has to be the first plot point. I think that this typically happens because um, even myself and other uh, people who give writing advice in general will often give examples of what the first plot point might look like. And that can sort of, those sort of examples can make people feel that anything that fits into that type of scene has to be the first plot point, which is not the case. So, you know, we might give examples like, you know, getting kidnapped or getting, you know, um, going to a new school, you know, as things where it marks um, the entry into the uh, second quarter or the second act because, you know, it's a point of no return. However, those events could occur earlier. It, th those events don't mean that that's the first plot point because it's more than just the content or the concept of the scene. Um, so a really good example of this, which will hopefully illustrate what I'm trying to explain better than I'm explaining it right now, is The Hunger Games. Um, and I'm going to talk about the film, not the book. So in the film of The Hunger Games, we might think about the story. Say we were writing the story, we might think, okay, Katniss volunteering to uh, be the tribute to replace her sister because her sister's name is called to participate in the Hunger Games and she volunteers. We might say, well, her volunteering is the first plot point because of the point of no return. You know, it's this big decision she can't take back and it sets her on the path to the rest of, for the rest of the story. But there's a big problem with that concept, which is that that actually only occurs 11% into the film. So in order for that to be the first plot point, we would have needed to bulk up the first part of the quarter to make that happen late enough that it would hit as the first plot point. And that might have been a big mistake if we were plotting this thinking that has to be the first plot point um, because it would have really messed up sort of the pacing because we kind of want to get things moving along. You know, we don't want to linger um, in her district for too long and delay getting to the meat of the story because it's a pretty complicated story with a lot of characters and events and things like that. So we kind of want to get it off the ground. Well, you might in that case be thinking then, okay, so Katniss agrees to go to the Hunger Games so she doesn't have a debate because, you know, that was sort of her call to action and she accepted it and she, you know, she didn't debate. She didn't question. However, we do have a debate for Katniss and it does occur after she agrees to be the tribute to replace her sister. And her debate is actually about whether or not she's able to attempt to win the games. Sort of specifically, it's implied that her big question is, you know, can I kill people? Can I kill people to survive and to win? We kind of get the impression that she's going to choose to not, that she's going to choose to not participate in the games or to sort of just accept her death. And we get this debate very clearly, it's just very easy to miss if you're looking at structure in terms of examples of plot points or, or certain plot, certain events mean that something is a certain plot point rather than the vibe or the tone or what's going on internally sort of defining what those sections are. So after Katniss agrees to be the tribute, she talks to her family and she tells her mom, you know, you need to take care of Prim, her little sister. You need to take care of her now. They sort of imply that the mother has been depressed and hasn't done a very good job taking care of her. And we can sort of infer that Katniss might be saying, you know, I'm not coming back. It's up to you now. We also have Gail who tells her, you know, find a bow. You know, it's just like hunting. And she says, you know, I hunt animals. You know, the implication being I don't hunt people. And then later when she is on the train with uh, Peta, Peta, you know, is competing alongside her. They both have a mentor and that mentor is Hamish. And Peta and Hamish, you know, Hamish is not really very uh, willing to help them at first, but Peta sort of is like pursuing that, you know, he's like, come on, you know, you, you gotta help us, you know, we need help. And Katniss sort of says, you know, there's no point, you know, it doesn't matter, we don't need, you know, basically, you know, in her mind, she's saying, you know, we're going to die anyway, you know, and what difference does it make? We're going to die. So, you know, whatever, like we don't, we don't need to, to try so hard to try to make this work out. However, we see Katniss watching coverage of a previous game and she sees the moment where one of the previous tributes became the victor by killing the last person um, in the Hunger Games, so everyone died, they became the champion. And in that moment, we see Katniss sort of have this realization or this sort of inspiration. Um, and then 
we don't really get any specific information about what it is so we really do have to infer what it is and and um again it's that event where she's sort of faced with the reality you know if you choose to die you know you're going to be the one in this footage who died and if you choose to be the victor you're going to have to be the one who does the killing so we know that she's made a choice because she overhears um Peta and hamish having a conversation you know uh, they're talking about strategy and things like that. And she comes into the room, having just overheard them say, you know, something like that'll get you killed. And she comes into the room and says, what will get you killed? And that's the first time that she's engaging with that concept of, you know, how can we win? You know, how, how can I not die? So we know then that she has made a choice that she is choosing, that she is going to attempt to win, which means she is going to have to try to kill people or succeed in killing people. Um, so she has chosen that path. So I really, really like this example because it shows that the structure of a novel is not always the most obvious or the most straightforward or what might occur to you at first when you're first looking at your ideas and you're first looking at plotting, it might not be that super obvious choice. You know, that moment that feels like the first plot point might not be the first plot point. And if you try to force it to be or conceptualize it to be, you might get confused either about where you place the debate, whether there is a debate. So really try to open up a little bit, um, <laughs> open up, um, I guess, your thinking. It can be so difficult to do that, to separate those examples that you might have heard of first plot points from sort of like the practicality of how they actually play out or the concept of how they play out it can be so hard to separate those ideas but if you can really focus on those in between sections and what those sections are doing it can help you to better pin down where exactly those plot points fall and which plot point you know you really want to actually be the first plot point because it's not always going to be the most obvious option so that is all that I have for you today. I really, really hope that this helped you to understand this section of the novel. I know that it's kind of a tricky, complicated section. If you have questions, let me know. I'm happy to make follow-up videos or answer any questions in the comments if, if they're easy enough that I can do that. Um, so definitely let me know. Also, again, please do let me know what novels you'd like to see structurally broken down in future videos because that is also something that I want to do um, once we get through this series to sort of help pull it all together and we can really dissect and look at one story beginning to end or several stories beginning to end. You know, how do, how do these things really play out um, over an entire novel? So let me know about that. If you want to help to support the channel, I do have a Patreon, which you can support. Um, I'll put a link in the description. The next video is going to be about the intuitive pantser. I know a lot of you have been waiting a really long time for that video. It will finally be up probably week after next if all goes well. So we will, you know, all keep our fingers crossed that I can manage to get it done in, in that time frame. Thank you all so much for your support, whether on Patreon, through your comments, watching the videos, sharing the videos. It really means a lot to me. And I will see you all again soon. And in the meantime, happy writing.